Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jani.tv. Today's segment is Community Stars. And for today's uh, episode, I have a very interesting person uh, whom I have known for a few years now, and I've always admired her work, uh, running marketing for pretty large organizations to startups based in Silicon Valley. And she comes from a solid engineering background and then became a marketeer, has a solid network, uh, very well connected in Silicon Valley, and has seen the ups and downs of this market and the industry. So she is uh, Swarna Podila, and uh, she's our community star. Swarna, welcome to Jani.tv and uh, tell us about your childhood and your background. Sure. Thank you so much for the great intro. Um, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for having me on the on Jani.tv as well. Um, I came from a really small town um, in South India and I've uh, growing from a humble uh, roots um, where in a small town where the word about you would get home before you got home, where everyone in the town knew you um, and knew your family. So you couldn't really sneak anything past them. Um, so growing in such a small town and also in financial hardships, I just followed uh, the path that my mom showed me back in the day. Become an engineer, earn well, like make good money and live a comfortable life. Back then it was just two options and become an engineer or become a doctor because those were the two very lucrative career options that were available. So I, I chose the engineer because I did not have the patience to become a doctor. <laughs> um, but growing from there, it was um, definitely an interesting journey for me. Uh, every single career move that I've done so far till date, it may seem like intentional or deliberate, but it is anything but intentional. It just was kind of like one of the talks that I gave at a past event called Montoberfest, where it feels like my career path was like a Spider-Man's path where sometimes I'm spinning the weave, uh, spinning the web to climb onto the next uh, higher or taller building. And sometimes I'm just literally spinning the we uh, web mainly not to fall really hard and uh, break my <laughs> sorry behind so it was uh, definitely a lot of ups and downs and interesting curves and challenges so i'm glad to be here in the valley and coming from a very uh, related networking engineering background uh, in my undergrad i'm really happy to be in the silicon valley and also in the tech world where networking is very important not just from a technical side but also from a people skill side networking and connecting with people um, staying true to yourself and being authentic yourself is extremely important for us. Completely relate to it. Uh, I have gone through the drill. I went through the coaching for MSET. I have yeah. uh, uh, written MSET uh, and I know uh, what it takes. So uh, it's a, it's amazing that, you know, we, we share a similar background. I come from a very humble background. Uh, I went through the same drill. I belong to this almost the same generation where uh, the choices were pretty confined to being a doctor or engineer. Um, so I can totally relate to it. But um, how did you make it to Silicon Valley? It's, it, I know it's not easy. A lot of, lot of folks from our generation who finished their engineering almost ended up being in US, but, uh, but very few actually made it to Silicon Valley and made a mark. Uh, so, so tell us about your journey to the Valley. Sure. Um, again, it was a happy coincidence. I got married and I was working at Sun Microsystems in Bangalore. I happily settled over there, thought that it was going to be my future is over there. But my husband got a job opportunity here in Mountain View, which is in the heart of the area. So when he got a job, I and decided to quit my uh, job in at Sun Microsystems and moved with him. But after I got here, I wanted to really pursue my uh, master's degree. And I really wanted to either get an MS in computer science because that's the kind of, again, natural progression. But my husband was the one that saw the potential in me. And he said, I did not see you as someone that would be sitting at a desk coding by themselves, um, just getting the work done by themselves. I see a really energetic and um, exciting kind of uh, personality in you. So why don't you consider the path of MBA? So I explored that path. And uh, through my MBA program at Santa Clara University, I 
leaned a little closer to marketing because it felt like the natural kind of inclination for me. I did I did several classes between management, accounting, finance, uh, econ, and marketing, but marketing felt like a lot closer to hard. So kind of from uh, after graduating from there, again, my network from my business school also helped me understand what my passion should be, what my kind of aspiration should be, where my natural strengths and expertise kind of um, is drawing me towards. So I kind of ended up, again, a happy coincidence. It feels like a happy coincidence now, but it was a lot of work back then. (laughs) Having kids, um, being pregnant, working at a very small startup, which was in stealth mode and launching them into um, like out of stealth and helping them grow from nothing to $6 million in revenue while doing my evening or part-time MBA graduating, it all feels like extremely excruciatingly painful uh, now, but back then it felt like that it was the right thing to do. So yeah, it, it, it was a lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears, but I'm really happy I went through that path. And I'm also really happy that my husband saw the potential in me because now I, when I look back, I do feel that, yeah, I probably would not have enjoyed or um, thrived in a coding or development kind of a role, because that is not something that I'm probably good at i completely understand uh, and it's not it's not easy multitasking and learning new skills because you come yeah. from an engineering background and then you move to marketing yeah. so uh, so swana i i think i first met you when you were at citrix uh, you know which is like that a pretty a large enterprise <laughs> yeah yeah almost a decade plus i think uh, the first time i i met you in one of the conferences and then you know i, I have seen you uh, lead marketing and define the entire positioning for a couple of startups. And then I, I, I followed your work at uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Uh, and, you know, from there to HashiCorp and most recently at Isovalent. So, you know, what interests me and uh, what actually makes you slightly different from the others is a very diverse set of companies that you have been working at. You know, you have been at large enterprises like Sun Microsystem, Citrix. You have been at very early stage startups. And then you have been at an open source foundation, right? So these are very different uh, entities and represent a very different persona by themselves in the community and the ecosystem. So so I'm, I'm very curious to hear the difference that you have seen in the cultures, you know, between these large enterprises, the open source foundations and uh, startups. Yeah, it's very different. Um, I also worked at another large organization called Semantic back in the day. And it is, it is, I will agree with you that it is very different. Each company brought its own set of practices and processes and also its own set of culture and norms and values. So it was very different. I think at larger companies, it was, at least for me personally, it was easier for me to feel like my voice was not heard or it was easier for me to feel like a cog in the wheel, um, which even if it suddenly disappeared, the rest of the cogs pretty much kept the machine running. So it, it was easy for, it's also easy for anyone to feel kind of lost in that huge ecosystem of employees uh, in a larger company. But I think the one difference that I've seen with the managers that I've had at larger companies particularly is that it was mainly their responsibility to make us feel heard, make a, make our voices and our opinions, our experience and expertise matter, and to inspire us to do something big and something new. Like at Semantic, I was there only for a little over three years, but I grew significantly higher because the managers, every single manager that I've had over there kept fostering or kind of giving me opportunities to travel, to meet with customers, to give executive briefings for the customers, analyst briefings, press briefings, like give a whole set of diverse opportunities. So in order for me to grow and be where I am, that kind of large company ecosystem definitely helped, especially when I was early on in the career, having like being at a company where all of those systems and teams and processes were established was a lot more helpful because I didn't have to worry about defining those processes. I could just get embedded into an existing system. And then as I kind of moved on and progressed into the later stages of my career, I started looking at startups, early stage startups, like either Avi Networks or Isovalent. Um, and 
over there, I had the opportunity to define. So at Avi Networks, I was the head of product marketing. And at Isovalent, I joined as head of mar product marketing, but took on a bigger role of head of marketing and got to build out the entire either product marketing function or marketing function. So it was the opportunity where I could have a much larger impact. So it's easier to feel that at smaller stages, because at early stage startups, because there isn't a whole lot of establishment or definition of systems, it's easier to have impact or to show impact because even 10% of the work that you do, if you do it in the right way, has a rippling effect or massive exponential impact on the revenue contribution or the impact of the um, sales and revenue. Um, in larger companies, it also exists, but it's harder to realize that impact or notice that impact. And the other way around, like the flip side of it is if you, if there is inaction at smaller companies, the impact is also extremely visible. Like if you don't perform at the expectations, there's literally no one else doing it. So the gap or the hole is instantly visible. Whereas at larger companies, there are other teams and other roles that can offset yours. So for me, I kind of, again, as I said early on, it seems deliberate and intentional, but it kind of was a, an interesting path that just naturally happened to me was that in the beginning of my career, I was at a larger company where I could take advantage of those existing systems and teams in place and learn and then move to early stage startups. Then that interesting deviation that you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned that was the uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation. Everyone, everyone in my network paused, took a pause and questioned me, like, why are you moving to a nonprofit open source foundation as a community manager, taking a detour from your marketing career and product marketing career. Well, that provided again, an interesting opportunity for me because even though officially it was a community manager title, I had the combination of product marketing, like I was still working on the content side of it so I could contribute to the content marketing side. Community management was something that I had not done at all. So that gave me a whole new experience on working with the community members, both on the engineering side, like who were contributing to the upstream projects, but also on the end user side who were consuming the projects and giving feedback back to the project teams so that they could, again, then set the project direction and strategy. It was just interesting to see both sides of it, the technology side of the community, of an open source community and the people side of the open source community. And as a nonprofit foundation, it was really easy for me at least to focus on the community's success and the project success rather than the financial success. Like we were, at least as a community manager, I was not tied to financial goals. So it was easy for me to focus on the people aspect and help them focus on the technology aspect. So I learned a lot, like those three years at Cloud Foundry Foundation were phenomenal. And I would never, never, uh, like I have never regretted taking that slight detour because that helped me understand, again, coming to HashiCorp right after Cloud Foundry, that really helped me understand how to focus on the practitioners who use the technology. Even though I was on the product marketing side of the uh, product portfolio at HashiCorp, I was still officially in the developer relations team. So help me under help me focus on the people side of it. Like how would the HashiCorp products practitioners, like users on the HashiCorp product side, how would they want to consume content? How would they want to read the content when they come to any of the HashiCorp web properties, or if they hear about Terraform or Nomad or Console, Waypoint, Boundary, any of those projects, once they hear what does the practitioner journey look like and how can we build a seamless journey? So it really helped me understand the different dynamics between open source, commercial, and companies with an open core product strategy that then sell commercial as a, an upsell model. I'm sure, you know, when, when you decided to join Cloud Foundry, it raised a lot of eyebrows because the timing was also very different. That, oh, that yeah. was when, um, you know, Pivotal was pivoting uh, from Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes and Kubernetes was taking over the entire infrastructure platform world. Cloud Foundry was not the most preferred platform that the developers chose. So, uh, you know, it, that, that, that was like a pretty challenging role uh, back then because you're le it was an uphill battle uh, mm -hmm. to position Cloud Foundry against the uh, whole world, which is 
going to Kubernetes. So uh, great. So uh, so I, that's what makes you very unique, Kaswarna. So I have not seen uh, marketeers, you know, who has this diverse experience of dealing with very different entities. So uh, so th th that actually uh, brings us to the next question. So you work with companies that only had hardcore commercial products, you know, like like Citrix or AV networks. And then you work with companies which were known to be open source companies, but also had uh, some way of monetizing and commercializing their products. So uh, what is the what is the biggest challenge for you when you are positioning the commercial flavor of an open source product in the market? which is available on github and you know there is no reason for anyone to go buy but uh, how did you actually you know i'm particularly talking about hashicorp because hashicorp is a very unique entity uh, i am a customer of hashicorp you know the day doesn't end without using terraform at least once uh, and there are a lot of devops engineers uh, who use hashicorp and uh, they never care about the commercial side of hashicorp they don't even know that they can buy hashicorp so what was your number one challenge positioning these commercial flavors of open source products I think you pretty much articulated right there. The biggest challenge was to help people understand, especially the developers and operators, know that HashiCorp is the company behind all of these projects. People, a lot of people knew about Terraform. A lot of people still know Terraform, but have absolutely no clue that HashiCorp is the company behind Terraform. And I think that was going in, that was the biggest challenge we had, that it was really hard for us to have the brand association, that this project is so successful, but there's still a non-trivial percentage of users or practitioners that don't know the company behind it. Uh, again, taking my marketing skills or product marketing sk skills, working on the project web pages and having some sort of branding, like working with the product design team, working with the creative design team and making sure that we had that kind of brand association on the digital properties, whether it's the website or documentation site, so that people instantly knew that, oh, when they come to terraform.io or the documentation uh, uh, site of the Terraform or the tutorials, they knew that HashiCorp branding was all over. So they knew that ha HashiCorp was the company behind it. That was the biggest, from a brand association perspective, that was the biggest challenge. The second challenge is, as you mentioned, it's available on uh, GitHub for free. Like, why do I need to even talk to a sales rep? Why do I need to talk to anyone from HashiCorp? I raise a, a pull request on GitHub or submit an issue somewhere else if that is the place. And the engineers take a look at it and respond to it and we're done. I, why do I need to engage with the company, the rest of the company? Um, the primary, I think there, there will be, there have always been and there will always be a set of practitioners who will never want to opt for the commercial offering. And the biggest, um, motive, uh, biggest learning point for me at HashiCorp was the fact that it's okay for us to never sell to this audience. And that's what at least at HashiCorp made it so much, so much more authentic and also makes HashiCorp so much more personable and appealing to end users because the company, the leadership has figured out that it's okay to not sell to this percentage of the audience. And let's just focus on the audience that does care about that additional either features, the product feature set, or the professional services, or the support that they get, or just the safety net that they always have, if they run into um, any kind of seven issues or bugs. So it was understanding, do we want to, should we want to sell to this audience? I think that's the biggest challenge when a company has an open source product strategy, like open core product strategy with a commercial offering on top of it. Um, even then, the challenge always exists with the cost or budget. I don't have budget or my company does not have enough um, like team members to support this project internally. But at the same time, I cannot pay for a commercial offering because I just don't have the budget or I am not the budget holder. Like I need to get approval from someone really way up high in the chain, in the corporate chain. And that is going to take a long time or any of those kind of challenges. But then again, even with open source only, we still had the same challenges that I don't have a big enough team that can deploy this product internally, 
build it, like keep maintaining it and support it in a long term. So I need to figure out some kind of a mix, so th which is why products like Terraform or Console, they all also have the kind of pricing or different packaging models to appeal to that kind of audience. So again, it was that learning curve that we went through as a company that was selling an open core product and then commercial offerings, commercial flavors on top of it to slowly onboard the customer in a less rocky way. Like we needed to give them enough value or incentive to show that it is worth paying HashiCorp the money, but at the same time, not having to worry about the big bucks or the big millions of dollars che of checks that they need to sign because that usually becomes a much more complicated, complex as a first conversation that they need to have. So it's always a challenge. Um, I have felt that it's a lot easier as a marketer to be at a company like Avi Networks where there is no open source as a product model. So you just sell it to enterprise customers. There's only proprietary product to sell. Or um, I'm yet to work at a company that has open source only, but a lot of early stage startups that I'm um, kind of looking at these days are still at a stage where they only sell the free tier or the open source only tier. And they're still considering when and how to launch their paid tier as well or a commercial flavor. So, it's always interesting to see that journey as well, um, the discussions. And th that's also kind of where being in the developer relations team at HashiCorp helped me understand what is that inflection point? When do people suddenly like have their ears perked up when they hear about the enterprise features? What, what makes them change the conversation to uh, a sales or enterprise commercial, whatever you want to call it? To that setting from an open source setting. Absolutely. You know, there was a time when the only way of monetizing open source was through professional services. And I think Red Hat you know, defined that really well and it, it became a role model for a lot of open source companies. And, and then uh, there has been a transition where the products, you know, went beyond uh, just uh, the companies went beyond offering professional services and also had I think a SaaS based version or an enterprise flavor of the open source and HashiCorp has pretty much led that, uh, that entire bandwagon of, uh, yeah, you have open source, but you know, if you want to run it in the managed environment in a cloud, here is our Terraform cloud, here is our council on Azure and, and they have done a pretty good job. And I think that is becoming the model and thanks to cloud, uh, you have two, two DIY, you know, two versions. One is DIY where you're on your own. And second is completely managed and uh, the heavy lifting is done by the companies. And that model has changed the dynamics completely. So you only sell the cloud version or the managed version and call it the subscription model or the enterprise bundle professional services and it becomes a skew by itself. I think that is the evolution um, that I'm seeing. Yep. Excellent. Now, um, the other uh, very important aspect, you know, when it comes to open source is is the uh, developer advocates or this community evangelist. And you have been an evangelist yourself at Cloud Foundry. Uh, and, and then I'm sure as a, as a marketing head, you would have worked with developer advocates and influencers uh, who take your product to the outside world and excite developers and operators. So uh, I, I come from a strong evangelism background. I spent most of my life as a technology evangelist or a developer advocate at Microsoft and then AWS. So uh, I, I know how that role works, but I want to, I want to hear your perspective from a marketeer's uh, uh, point of view. How do you, how do you see this role uh, influencing the product marketing aspect and how critical are they in making you as a marketeer successful? At least in the last six, seven years, I have, come to just completely rely on this function for the groundswell adoption or the awareness, um, the top of the funnel marketing, top of the marketing funnel activities, because if, I mean, anyone can look up a marketing funnel, but it's the top of the activities are awareness, generating awareness and interest. Uh, how can we help anyone hear about the company or the product or the technology? And then how can we create that interest in them now that they've heard about it? So. At least the developer advocacy 
community evangelism, developer evangelism, developer relations teams, all of these, like, depending on your company, you may call it one way or the other, but their function is primarily to go and kind of uh, permeate the message and the value of the product and company in the community. And it has been really helpful. Um, and I keep looking back at the companies before that I worked in a way kind of even further back in the past where we didn't have this kind of function, where we essentially relied on our SEs. The pre-sales SEs, the sales engineers would become like, they were acting as our developer advocates because they had the perfect middle ground of knowing the product and the technology very well, knowing the landscape of the competitive, like competitive products in an enterprise setting and in, in the setting of an open source or a com true community model, what are the alternatives? Like, what else can I take a look at? Um, those things and also enough context in terms of what does a typical customer of this size or of this product would be interested in listening to? Like, what would they, what messages would resonate to that audience? And enough of the marketing skill to focus on those key messages of the product or the company and then quickly come into the technology, the technical side of it. So I always, um, I mean, I always used to say that SEs were my go-to people back in the day when I was working at typical or the proprietary enterprise companies only. And ever since I started working on the open core, like at the open core companies, I developer advocates are my SEs. Uh, they are the perfect combination of sales, marketing, product management, and engineering, and then evangelism, like public speaking. So they pretty much are the true Swiss knives of the technology. So for me as a marketeer and as a person that comes from the marketing function, they are extremely critical. Some companies have this function in engineering, some in product management, some in marketing. I really don't care where this function lies as long as they are given that kind of um, liberty and flexibility to go into the community, not only share the value of the product, but also get the feedback from the community and then bring it back to the engineering or the product team so that we can then shape the product based on that and then bring the feedback back to the marketing team saying, when we present it this way or when we articulate the messages this way, it does not land well with the audience. So let's kind of tweak the message or sharpen it, fine tune it so that it really resonates well and we kind of get that initial um kind of um, the steeper curve a little more flatter so that it's the onboarding the experience or the onboarding experience is a bit flatter. Um, so they are definitely my go-to people or go-to function at the moment. Um, and when done correctly, um, and that, that is extremely critical, like doing this function correctly is extremely critical, but when done correctly, they provide, as a selfish marketeer here, they provide the top of the funnel for me. Like they bring the top of the funnel audience who are interested, who are aware of our product, who want to use our product, or at an open core company have already used the open source version of the product. And then all that is left for the marketing team to do is to keep that interest going, but also to identify that inflection point of when we can transition the conversation into an enterprise or a sales discussion. So for me, developer relations, developer advocacy, community evangelism is an extremely critical function. It is highly, highly undervalued at many companies. And I see quickly, the companies quickly moving their developer relations team to focus on either solely on documentation or solely on bug fixes, or sometimes just on customer support, which is, with all of these are probably part of those functions, like part of their responsibilities, but they cannot be only that. Um, so it becomes quickly frustrating at different companies. But for me, it developer relations is an extremely important function. And it's I can absolutely see why it is growing to be not only popular, but also so critical for many of our open source companies, especially. Absolutely. I... Uh, I couldn't take any more. I, I love the fact that you call the developer advocates as the Swiss knives. So I think uh, that's that's a very apt description uh, to to define the persona of a developer evangelist. One of my bosses, uh, one of my managers, very early in my career, told me developer evangelism is like parenting. You cannot outsource it. <laughs> so you cannot have a consultant run developer evangelism for you. You know, just like parenting, you a product that you own is your baby. 
and you got to be completely passionate and have the conviction in taking it to the community and uh, and, and and showcase it so absolutely developer evangelism go hand in hand with product marketing and they have to work very closely so circling back to one of my earlier questions swarna so uh see today it's almost uh, it's almost very difficult to uh, find a company that doesn't have an open source strategy particularly with cloud native and cncf becoming uh, the the focus areas and today most of the startups have a cloud native strategy and uh, they are all aligned with open source but there are some outliers uh, who sell to cloud native ecosystem but don't have an open source component or an open source project at all forget about open core they don't even have a side project that they can uh, effectively talk to uh, uh, the developers or to the community so my question is how how important it is to have some presence in the open source world uh, for these platform companies and particularly companies targeting the cloud native ecosystem sure um my when uh, my manager at cloud foundry foundation used to always call this um call this out is your are you using open source as a development model or a business model there is a very um very clear difference between the two when you use open source as the development model you have either project contributions or you have your own project that you're trying to either have the community use or donate it to a foundation neutral foundation or just have multiple vendors kind of contribute to it whether it's a hashicorp model or um isovalent model it really doesn't matter but you have an open core project and you either have a dedicated engineering team working on the open source project or you donate it to a neutral foundation and have multiple vendors kind of collaborate even if they're com- your competitors you still have them collaborate and contribute to the upstream project so that is the open source as a development model you use the open source community and ecosystem to contribute to the engineering uh resources or the engineering efforts of the project involved and then there's open source business as a business model where you're primarily selling either professional services or you're primarily selling to that open source ecosystem of users or you're partnering with the providers to provide solutions to those um uh to those to those end users or customers without absolutely ever contributing to any kind of engineering efforts or without having any kind of open open source project of your own and it is also fine like having either one of those is not a wrong or incorrect model as long as you make it clear in your value prop that this is what we do um red hat never goes with yes we sell like we have a, an entire technical product portfolio for and yes they do have services and probably even some value added features on top of it but their primary revenue model is um professional services back in openstack days we had mirantis they were also very professional services driven kind of revenue model and then there was pivotal which is a combina- which was a combination of uh professional services but more importantly the revenue model was the product or the offering the commercial offering that they would sell the pivotal cloud foundry so it's it's perfectly fine there is no wrong or right way as long as you don't oversell your uh yourself or your company i've seen a lot of i say bad players but it's kind of like the bad selling or uh pitching mechanism where they don't have any kind of technical contributions but they still kind of position themselves as a very valued technical contributor or member of the community or the ecosystem which the community is smart enough like we're all kind of smart and in- very intelligent professionals we can see through it very quickly if someone said the same pitch to us we would kind of smell the difference miles away so why would we pitch that and that i think that's the main uh main thing that many of us need to keep in mind it really doesn't matter how we are present in the ecosystem as long as we are very clear about how we are there uh we cannot Absolutely. oversell it we cannot try and deceive anyone yeah so bottom line you know adding a prefix of open doesn't make you open so we have so many examples of that and uh, just 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 by adding open to your product positioning doesn't make you anything 
to do with open source. So I think that is that is the critical takeaway from this. Uh, so you know, I I work with a lot of CMOs as an advisor, helping them uh, look at the product from the eyes of a developer. And this is one of the very early feedbacks that I give. You know, if you don't have nothing to offer to the open source community, stay uh, uh, say that up front. There is nothing wrong, but 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 don't try to uh, cover up. Uh, you know your commercial product in the guise of an open source by adding some buzzwords and try to make it look like a sheep uh, you know uh, with an open source flavor so uh, i totally you don't agree. have to ride the wave you don't ra- have to ride the popularity wave and you don't have to be another player in the market you can be yourself and still fit in and still bring your entire value like you probably are not contributing the same way as the other members of the open source ecosystem, but you have your own value. Like there's a reason why you have your own company and your your set of offering, whether it's services or anything else, there's a reason for that. And just present it that way, position it that way. Yeah. yeah. Don't, uh, don't skin your commercial product yeah. <laughs> as an open source cat. <laughs> Agreed. So uh, excellent. So now um, the other very interesting trend, uh, a very disruptive trend that I'm seeing for now is this whole generative AI. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of companies, uh, particularly on their content strategy. And uh, I, I sometimes uh, edit their articles and their content, their website copies and give them feedback. And today I'm seeing a lot of these companies adopt uh, generative AI and giving it the, uh, you know, the first shot generating something which is which is acting as a template and then iterating over it and, and then adding more to it so uh, as someone who would have worked with a lot of content writers and copywriters and created content for websites uh, how do you see this generative ai and chat gpt specifically impacting product marketing is it a boon or a bane I want to say it's too early, but I think that's the very standard or a cop-out answer. So I'm going to take us probably a decade or so back into the past. Um, I don't know if you remember the whole search engine optimization, the SEO-based marketing, and how we were all trying to stuff our content with keywords, right? We wanted our content to be uh, easy to be, dis- like, easy easily discoverable when people search for specific keywords, we wanted our content to surface up. So we would play the Google search algorithm game. We would play the SEO game and we'd stuff our content with keywords. I think I have seen some examples of um, the generative AI tools like ChatGPT or anything else. I've seen people experiment with it, like write a pitch about this or write uh, write a sales pitch email about this product or write a background or a bio for this person based on this technologies or their experience. And the output that I've seen so far is very, it seems very, it feels very similar or familiar with the whole keyword stuffing. When I read the content or the output of those generative AI tools, it felt very stale. Synthetic. (laughs) Yeah, artificial. Like you can tell when there's so there's a difference w- between following the recipe and making everything from scratch, and let's say cooking noodles like stir fried noodles or uh, any of those kind of recipes from the scratch at the end. Like there's a difference between that and cup noodles. Pour hot water and take it. Yes, they're both noodles. Yes, they both taste spicy and kind of similar. Yes, they both have sort of kind of sort of some sauces and vegetables, but is it really replaceable? I think we are still at that stage of the cup noodles phase of chat GPT or these kind of generative AI tools where it feels like a good enough starter template. But if you truly take the time to take a step back and put the kind of initial draft or the template of the content yourself, it will be very different and very useful and helpful than what any of these tools can ever give you. Um, I had to laugh when I was at a previous um, conversation in one of my earlier conversations of several months ago, there was this whole trend of, oh, let's have 
chat GPT write a sales pitch or a sales cold outreach letter or a campaign narrative. It was really abysmal. I saw the output and I'm like, I really don't want ever anyone to use this level of generative AI tools. So I think we're still at that early stage. Who knows, with the algorithms getting better, with the feeding mechanisms like the machine learning and the language learning models getting better, uh, it might get to a point where it's going to give us a good enough start, especially if it can benefit those teams who don't have that kind of team capacity quite yet to build out their marketing function or to build out their content writing function to a level where they can start from scratch and this can give a good enough starting point from for them. But I would still say that even if we use it, at least at the moment, take a step back and read and reread and see if that is the thing that you really want to put out in your name or in your company's name. Um, like I would never have a generative AI tool write an email for me. Like I would still, I, I, as of today, I would not rely on it quite yet. Yeah, I, I, I love the example of cup noodles versus meticulously preparing noodles. Uh, when you taste, you can find the difference absolutely. And I, you can tell as what an author, we're doing during the uh, lockdown. Who, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, one of the biggest uh, risks I have as an author is thinking uh, that someone would come back and say, hey, uh, you didn't write it. This is generated by ChatGPT. And that is the most, you know, insulting comment you can ever have uh, from your reader. So I'm actually, as an author uh, who cover technology on a day-to-day -day basis, I am really concerned uh, that, you know, people will look at it from the face value and they don't take time to understand human written content versus bot written content. And all of them will look alike uh, because people don't have patience to understand the, the nuances of you know, human written and the sentiment that actually shows up uh, versus something that is auto-generated by AI. So that is always back of my mind when I write something. I want to make sure it reflects my personality and has something unique uh, that connects the readers back to me. Uh, that that's very challenging. Yeah. And the second thing, uh, I also play the role of an evangelist for AI, and I'm very close to understanding how this works. But uh, all I can say is, you know, there are very uh, specialized models that are coming up, uh, targeting individual domains. And as they get fine tuned, as they get trained, uh, they will become better. And they, very soon, it's very hard to. Uh, distinguish between human written content versus bot written content is getting there. It's a matter of few more months. So, so we are at a very interesting. It's a twilight zone that we are in, uh, right. seeing both sides of the story, and time will tell on how this is going to land. So, great. Now, uh, one one last question, Swarna. I know you have been uh, multitasking, and we started this conversation with you saying you have been multitasking and. Uh, you you shifted your career lines pretty quickly. So what makes you productive? Uh, and I ask this to all my guests because most of my guests are unique personalities, highly accomplished, and they are multitasking. So what is that single productive tip that you can leave us with? Um, there's one that I can definitely publicly admit. Um, call me old or ancient at the moment, but... I still feel that focusing on one task, even though we have to multitask, and especially as I have grown into seniority functions, there's like literally 60 or 70 things that we have to do over the course of a week, um, sometimes over the course of a day or two. It's really hard to focus, but when I have to get, especially when I have to get the writing work done, when I have to write down a blog post or uh, positioning or the messaging statements or the messaging, build out a positioning framework, Closing everything out and just having that one application open is, it's really helpful for me. I absolutely have uh, no notifications on for any of my social apps. Um, I only have uh, mentions and DMs kind of notifications for certain Slack workspaces that I'm on. Email does not have, I do not have any kind of desktop notifications and phone is always set to do not disturb when I'm writing. So just Focusing on it, it really helps and makes a difference. Um, I have seen multitasking and having all of those open usually would take me six to seven hours to write the same content piece. But when I'm focused, I probably can 
finish it up at a near to completion kind of a stage or a writing quality within an hour or two. So it's it's very obvious to me that, yes, we all multitask and we have to multitask in this day and age, but sometimes we just need to focus on one thing at a time. Um, and of course, the other thing that helps me be productive is when I have something new that I need to learn or that I need to do, when I have absolutely no clue about a particular product or a particular technology, that drives me, that motivates me. So it kind of helps me be more productive because I really want to learn about this and I cannot wait until I can deliver some sort of meaningful content pieces on that particular topic. So it's productivity sometimes also comes from motivation for me or inspiration. Absolutely. Uh, couldn't take any more again because um, you might multitask, but boxing yourself uh, into that zone where you are squarely focused on one task, at least for a couple of hours, will make a huge difference. Excellent. All right. So, uh, Suswana, uh, before we wrap up this conversation, I want to uh, bring this up. So, you are currently on a break. You you left Isovalent, and you are currently on a on a sabbatical, which I wish I could. <laughs> so, uh, so what 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 do we expect from Swarna next? You know, what what are you what are you currently up to, and what what's your aspiration? Well, yeah, I'm taking a break mainly because I just did not take a break for a long time in my career. And I just needed that time off to decompress. And again, to be more productive, we always need to take some rest and uh, rejuvenate ourselves. So um, I left Isovalent, uh, wow, now it's a couple months ago. <laughs> Already time flies. Uh, so I'm looking maybe in my next, I'm, I don't know when I will get there, but whenever I get there, it could be three weeks from now or three months from now, but um, I probably will look for either a uh, marketing leadership role at an early stage startup or an early stage company, um, or if it's a larger organization, maybe inheriting and kind of embedding myself into the process. But uh, building out a marketing function from the ground up is definitely a lot more exciting to me. So I'll probably favor more on the early stage companies who are looking for their first marketing hire or first marketing leader kind of a hire. Um, it's really exciting for me. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of, working, looking at uh, working a couple of part-time kind of opportunities. So I'm still keeping my brain and myself engaged uh, while still resting. But my core focus right now is just resting, taking a lot of naps and sleeping a lot. Excellent. Excellent. You should make uh, best use of that. All the viewers who are currently watching this, uh, Swarna is a phenomenal marketeer very well networked you actually go ask anyone in silicon valley they are only two degrees or three degrees away from swarna's connection so uh, uh she's she's phenomenal so uh if you are looking for uh someone to lead your marketing uh maybe you should just ping swarna and see if she's open to having a conversation so uh so that that actually brings us to the end of this conversation so swarna thank you so much for being a part of the show i thoroughly enjoyed the conversation uh, you brought up many insights as women in tech uh, transitioning, you know, from engineering to marketeer and working with a diverse set of companies. Uh, you carry a very different set of experiences and very different uh, 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 persona. So, so thanks again, and uh, we'll do a follow up whenever you are back in action. Whenever you are back at work, uh, we'll have more to discuss. So, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Johnny. I really enjoyed uh, being on the show as well. It, it was a great conversation. And thank you very much for the opportunity. And of course, you're always extremely kind and generous with your compliments. I, I appreciate that. Thank you.